As Stephanie and Jenna said, my name is Scott Davis. I'm a web architect and developer advocate with ThoughtWorks. Um, I've been doing web development for about 30 years or so at this point, and this is something I am truly, deeply passionate about. So we're here to talk about accessibility, and I know it can be trite to start off with a dictionary definition, but uh, if you'll bear with me, when I read this one particularly about accessibility, it really appealed to me. This feels like a great description of our job as web developers. Accessibility is being able to be reached or found. Accessibility is being easy to use. Accessibility is being easily understood or appreciated. Don't these sound like the goals of being a web developer? So why is it then that when we do a search on web accessibility, all of a sudden this word disability comes into the equation? It's curious, isn't it? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want us to ignore the disability aspect of accessibility. I don't want you to ignore your empathy or your core humanity. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping that after this talk, you'll spend more time thinking about these things. But when we frame the conversation of accessibility around disability, it opens the door for all kinds of excuses. I mean, why even bother with accessibility, right? I don't know anyone has, who has a disability, do, do you? I don't think any of my coworkers have a disability. Heck, I'm not even sure that our customers have disabilities. And how expensive will it be to make our website fully accessible? How far behind will it put us on our scheduled path to production? And what about the expertise? I don't work with anyone who specializes in accessibility. Do you? So instead of talking about accessibility in terms of disability, I like framing the conversation around the idea of universal design. This is a concept like so many concepts in software development that we've borrowed from building architects and civil engineering. Universal design is, is designing not for just some of the people or, or even most of the people. We design for all of the people. The success of our architecture is how usable it is by everyone who's trying to use it. This idea of universality is woven into the fabric of the web. Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, says the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. As a matter of fact, if you read the HTML5 specification, and I won't ask, you, if you've read the HTML5 specification, that would be too much, uh, that would be too embarrassing, wouldn't it? But if you do read the HTML5 language specification, you'll find that accessibility is discussed throughout. Look at that list of editors. You'll see a bunch of companies that you're probably familiar with, like Microsoft and Google. They're all browser manufacturers, of course. But Who's at the top of the list? That Steve Faulkner. And who's the Pacciello group? It turns out that the Pacciello group, or TPG for short, is one of the leading accessibility consultancies based out of the United States. So as you can see, accessibility isn't an afterthought when it comes to web development. It's not a nice to have if we have time for it. In fact, accessibility is core to what we do as web developers. It is fundamental to the web. So we'll get back to web development in just a moment here. For now, I want to focus on some of the real world examples of accessibility and universal design that you might experience every day and not even realize it. For instance, there's a law being broken here. 
Can you spot it? And no, it's not a fashion crime. Those shoes are just fine. I promise you, that's not the crime we're seeing here. Does this picture help? It's curb cuts. Those dips that bring the sidewalk down to street level. Curb cuts are a great example of universal design. Disability doesn't even enter into this particular discussion, does it? This is just a mother out for a walk with her child in a stroller, taking full advantage of curb cuts in her neighborhood. And curb cuts aren't even a new idea. Here's a curb cut from the 1940s in the United States, right after World War II ended. So you see, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, was passed in 1990. Ironically, right around the time that the web was first being introduced as well by Tim Berners-Lee. The ADA made curb cuts mandatory in cities across the United States. Now, almost 30 years later, they've become so ubiquitous that they just kind of fade into the background. We don't pay attention to them, but they are everywhere. And this is significant because a quarter of all Americans live with some form of disability. That 61 million people living in the U.S. alone. Worldwide, there are over 1 billion people living with a disability. Can you see why curb cuts are so simple and yet so valuable at the same time? As a matter of fact, curb cuts have been around for so long that they're the source of a number of great academic studies. And this is what I think is most interesting about these studies. They say, when the wall of exclusion came down, everyone benefited. Not only people in wheelchairs, parents pushing strollers, workers pushing heavy carts, business travelers with wheeled suitcases. A study of pedestrian behavior found that nine out of 10 unencumbered pedestrians go out of their way to use a curb cut. This is universal design at its finest. So I hope you see that accessibility improves everybody's experience, not just those with a disability. The reason I like using the phrase universal design instead of inclusive design is because by definition, it's hard to know when you're not being included. On the other hand, it's really easy to figure out when you're being excluded. Kat Holmes, who's the author of the fantastic book, Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design, says, ask a hundred people what inclusion means and you'll get a hundred different answers. Ask them what it means to be excluded and the answer will be uniformly clear. It's when you're left out. It's when you're left out. Here's a great example of what Kat is talking about. When I look at this entrance to a building on the campus of University of Colorado at Boulder, just up the road from my house where I'm talking to you today, I don't feel excluded at all. I can walk up those three short steps without any problems. I don't need a handrail to help me up. I can fit through those narrow doors without an issue. Heck. I don't even need a button to automatically open those doors for me. But did you notice that tiny blue sign in the lower right-hand corner of the image? That's the real life equivalent of this website best viewed in Internet Explorer. <laughs> that sign says the accessible entrance that you're looking for isn't here. 
it's it's over there around the corner that's exclusion in action right there here's an example of universal design and inclusivity in action another building on that same university of colorado campus notice that there are no steps to climb so there's no need for a handrail either those doors are considerably wider than those doors on the previous building. And we have a button to automatically open those doors for us. You've probably walked through ADA compliant entrances to buildings hundreds, if not thousands of times without ever even thinking about it. And while this is good, and this is good, we can do even better. We can do even better on the design of this building's entrance. Here's the entrance to my neighborhood grocery store. It's a hole in the wall. Now, I'm not talking about the store itself. The store itself is actually quite clean and, and modern inside. I mean the actual entrance to the building. It's literally a hole in the wall. It's an entrance that's wide enough for shoppers pushing grocery carts. It's wide enough for parents pushing strollers. It's wide enough for workers pushing heavy carts. And yes, it's wide enough for folks in wheelchairs and walkers to easily use as well. The buildings that grocery stores are in tends to be great examples of universal design in action. Wide aisles, well lit, easy to get around in and easy to find things. Which is why it's so ironic that the websites of grocery stores across the United States tend to be frequent targets of ADA-based web accessibility lawsuits. One of the first wins for ADA advocates was against the Winn-Dixie chain of grocery stores. The judge ruled that the Title III section of the ADA covering places of public accommodation, these are businesses that are generally open to the public, such as restaurants, movie theaters, schools, daycare facilities, recreation facilities, doctor's offices, the list goes on and on. These all places of public accommodations are also covered by the business's websites. This is called the nexus rule, that the website is an extension of the physical business and therefore is covered by the same ADA rules. And these ADA lawsuits in the US are growing dramatically year over year. There have been over 10,000 ADA related lawsuits every year for the past few years. And the projections for 2020 simply continue this trend. Now, in 2016, the European Union adopted the European Accessibility Act or the EAA. Now, while the ADA in the United States focused on brick and mortar accessibility, the EAA emphasizes digital accessibility. The EAA specifically addresses digital accessibility issues around computers and operating systems, around smartphones, around television broadcasts and online videos, around telephony, banking, ebooks, e-commerce, and all kinds of modes of transportation, including ticketing for air, bus, and rail. While the EAA was adopted in 2016, it was transposed into national law in September of 2018. Websites created after 2018 are required to be accessible by September 2019, almost a year ago now. And all existing websites must be accessible by September 2020, just a couple of months from now. 
mobile apps have until June of 2021 to be compliant with the accessibility requirements of the EAA. This new law will improve the digital lives of over 80 million European citizens who are currently living with a disability. And I hope many of these numbers will stick in your head. Over 60 million Americans live with some form of disability, one out of four Americans. Over 80 million European citizens currently live with a disability. That's almost one in five EU citizens. So these numbers are quite large. I hope you can see that accessibility now, or ally, which is simply a shorthand for a word that begins with the letter A and ends with the letter Y and has 11 letters in between. Uh, this notion of accessibility isn't just woken, woven into the fabric of the web. In many cases, it's woven into the fabric of the law as well. So then, Let's now get back into web development. I told you I'm a web developer. I'm a web architect. This is what I love. I want to show you some code and give you some live examples. So Alan Perlis was a famous software developer back in the 1950s. He actually won the first Turing Award ever awarded for software technologists. So while technically he wasn't a web developer, his quote here sure feels like it could be about HTML and accessibility. A language that doesn't affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. Now, if you haven't read the HTML5 language spec, you didn't think I was going to forget that, did you? I hope, if nothing else, after this presentation, we all go out and familiarize ourselves with the HTML5 language spec. It's free. I'm not saying it's the most exciting read you'll ever find, but it is free. And if we're web developers, we should at least have a nodding familiarity with it. So if you haven't re read it, uh, indulge me for a moment. Let me read just the first paragraph to you. It says, HTML is the World Wide Web's core markup language. Yes, yes, that is a true statement. And it has been for over 30 years. Isn't that remarkable? Over 30 years. Now. Here's the good one. Originally, HTML was primarily designed as a language for semantically describing scientific documents. Semantically describing scientific documents. This is true as well. Tim Berners-Lee was working at CERN at the time he created the web. CERN, of course, is the home of Large Hadron Collider, among other large, impressive scientific projects. But semantics, huh? What does that word mean, especially with, when it comes to regarding web development? Semantics, as it turns out, means quite literally meaning. And isn't that a lovely idea? Isn't it lovely to think that our job as web developers is to quite literally bring meaning to the world around? How's that for a powerful job description? And as you read the rest of the HTML language spec, I won't read the entire thing to you. Although if you have time, I have time. Should I, should I, should I just read the whole thing to you? No, okay, I, all right, I, I won't do that. I won't do that. But as you read the HTML language spec on your own after this presentation, you'll find that this notion of semantics shows up everywhere. In chapter three, the semantics and structure of HTML documents. Documents are built from elements. Yes, yes, this is a true statement. Chapter four, the elements of HTML. Each element has a predefined meaning. Oh, meaning you say? Oh, you mean semantics, right? Because every HTML element does have meaning behind it. So here's a basic bread recipe marked up in HTML and as Stephanie and Jen and I were laughing. I had this bread this morning. My wife and I have been making this bread recipe every other night for the whole duration of this global pandemic. So this is a very, I can personally vouch for this recipe. Um, but I want us to focus on the HTML, not the delicious crisp crust and the tender, I'm sorry, I got distracted again. Let's focus on the HTML, not the bread that results from this HTML. I want you to notice the headers. 
Uh, we'll see headers like H1. This is the primary header, no need bread. H2 is the secondary header uh, for things like ingredients and instructions that you'll see later on. Uh, you should also be able to see familiar elements like the P element for paragraphs, uh, the LI elements for list items. Uh, the list items of ingredients are wrapped in a full UL element for an unordered list. Later on, you'll see an OL element or a ordered list of, of list items later on. But this is what the HTML source code looks like. And here's what that same web page looks like when it's rendered in a web browser. Notice the meaning or, or semantics behind ingredients. Does it matter what order you pull the ingredients out of your cupboard? Can you grab the yeast before you grab the flour? Of, of course you can. This is an unordered list. So it means these are bulleted items, grab them in whatever order you please. But how about those instructions? Is that an ordered list or an unordered list? What happens, for example, if you were to preheat the oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit in step three, before you mix the ingredients and leave them to sit out on your counter overnight, steps one and two? you probably either get yelled at by your spouse when the utility bill arrives at the end of the month or your house burns down. <laughs> either way, I hope you can see that HTML is all about semantics and the semantics are truly important. If you refer back to the HTML5 language spec, language spec it tells you that each header element re represents the heading of a section. Now, if you're looking at this example here, you might be scratching your head because I know I don't normally add section elements whenever I'm using H elements, do you? But even if you do, and, and, and I don't, um, an implicit section element is created. In the case of our recipe, we end up with sections for ingredients and instructions just by using the H2 elements. So, right here in the language spec, it tells us that these two examples you can see right here, one using explicit section elements, one using implicit section elements, both of these examples are semantically equivalent, whether or not we explicitly include the section elements. That's helpful. That's good to know. And I mention this only because when I was taught HTML 30 years ago, my teacher focused on the look and feel or the styling of the elements rather than the semantics. I was taught that an H1 is bigger than an H2. An H2 is bigger than an H3. But as we just learned, starting with the very first paragraph of the HTML5 language spec, that HTML is for defining semantics, not look and feel. For styling, we have this thing called CSS, right? Cascading style sheets. I mean, it's right there in the name, right? That, that's, that's what we use for styling for look and feel issues. So if we were to use CSS to make H2 elements larger than H1 elements, do you think that that changes the semantics of the elements as well? Here's the CSS that makes H2 elements larger than H1. Now the measurement unit that you see here, the M, goes back to the invention of the printing press, the Gutenberg times, um, and the metal letter blocks used. The size of the font was measured in terms of the widest letter in the font, typically the capital letter M. So in our style sheet here, H1 elements are set to a font size of 1M or the basic size of body text in your document. H2 elements are set to a font size of 2M or twice the size of our body text. And here's what our newly rendered recipe looks like in the browser. 
the H1 is clearly the same size as the paragraph text that immediately follows it. And the H2s are twice the size of the body text. But do you think this affects the semantics of the document at all? No. No is the answer. But here's one way to test it. Let's take the visual aspect of the web page, the look and feel, completely out of the equation and instead listen to the semantics of the elements instead. To do this, we can take advantage of the assistive technology baked into every desktop computer, every laptop, every tablet, and every smartphone, regardless of the operating system. Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS or Android, every operating system today has a screen reader baked right into it. All we have to do is enable the screen reader and have it read our semantics back to us. Now, personally, I like reaching for my smartphone when it comes to testing accessibility. Not only is it easier to use, as we'll just see in just a moment here, but we're actually living in a mobile majority world right now when it comes to web usage. Using a smartphone simply better represents what your users are actually going to use when they visit your website. More than half of the world uses their smartphone for web access right now. And they have been since about 2017. In the next couple of years, over 75% of the world will use their smartphones for web access. And these folks are actually smartphone only. In the US today, the number of smartphone only users is over 20% or one out of five people. That's amazing to think about, isn't it? So using smartphones to test accessibility just makes sense because you're actually using the device that your users will most likely be using as well. To enable voiceover on iOS, you simply go to your general settings, choose accessibility, and choose the accessibility shortcut. On the accessibility shortcut screen, you can choose a variety of different things. Now, I happen to choose voiceover. So now, every time I triple click on the side button on my iPhone, voiceover turns on. And when I'm done with it, I can triple click, and that turns it back off again. That's why I affectionately call accessibility triple click and twist, as we're going to see, because on iPhones, you triple click and then you twist an invisible knob on the front of your screen. Now, if you're on an Android device, you might need to download the Android accessibility street if it's not already installed. But after you've done that, you can play around with TalkBack on Android to get similar functionality. I hope you will do this. I hope you will do this after this presentation because it's so easy to use and all of a sudden you feel like you're unlocking a whole new set of capabilities in that device that you already have in your pocket. All you're doing is taking advantage of the functionality that's already there. So here's how voiceover sounds on my iPhone. When I enable it and triple click and twist, well, maybe it's just easier to show you. Let's do that. Let me flip over, if you will, to, uh, if, if we can, to um, an example of this. Voice over on. Safari. Address. 192.168.1.1. 108. Double tap to show controls. Portrait. Headings. Three he links. Form controls. Tables. Form control. Links. Headings. All right, I'm going to pause right there for a second. Were you a little bit confused? Were you kind of saying, hey, wait a second, what's, what's going on here? Um, it's because uh, you were only using one sense, your, your, your visual sense. I wasn't sharing with you 
all of your senses. So let me actually go in and turn on closed captioning and replay this video and, and we'll see if by adding in an additional sense, this adds a little bit to your understanding and, and it enhances your experience. So here's that same experience with closed captioning turned on. Voice over on Safari address 192.168.1.108. So there's that triple click. One dot one hundred eight. Double tap to show controls. Portrait. Ah, oh, and here's the twist. Here's that invisible form controls, twist in the middle tables, of your screen. Form control links. Headings. Three headings. No need bread. Heading level one. Ingredients. Heading level two. Instructions. Heading level two. Screen curtain on. Ah, here's where I get Ingredients. Good. Heading level two. No need bread. Heading level one. No needing required. Four simple ingredients. Baked in a Dutch oven. The result is simple perfection. Hands down the best bread you'll ever eat. Another three finger Screen curtain off. And we're back. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing to think that that is in your pocket right now and this is where you can use? So many times when I'm talking to clients, they say, oh, well, we don't have the expertise to deal with uh, accessibility and we're really focused on audit reports. And, and while audit reports are important as well, reach into your pocket to that device I know you have and experience accessibility. A triple click and twist. A three-fingered triple tap to turn off your screen. A three-finger triple tap to turn it back on again. It's ridiculously easy, isn't it? So here's how I enabled this. I simply created a web VTT file or a web video text track file, which is a plain ASCII text file as we see right here. I copy and pasted that little header right up in there, but the bulk of this file is simply providing start and end times and then adding the text you'd like to see on the screen. So in this example here, from five seconds to 12 seconds, show triple click. From 17 seconds to 25 seconds, show two fingers spin the invisible knob on your screen. Web VT files are of, are, of course, part of the HTML5 language spec. And all you have to do is simply add a track element to the video element, and your browser will handle the rest. Now, I'm sure you're thinking that how come Scott doesn't sprechen Sie Deutsch? Your English is far better than my German. But can you see how something like this is not only focused on disabilities now, some people might say my disability is I don't speak German, um, but something like this allows us to turn around and internationalize this solution as well. And many times, all your browser has to know is that you natively speak German and when you visit English versions of things like this, it will suggest the proper closed captioning for you. It's amazing how easy this is. Now, what if we wanted to use JavaScript to speak our web page using the same speech synthesizer that your operating system screen reader used in the previous example? If we wanted to use JavaScript to speak our web page, it's as simple as creating a new speech synthesis utterance, and then calling the speak function. If we wanna see that in action, here's that read button using exactly the code I just showed you. Are you ready? No needing required. Four simple ingredients baked in a Dutch oven. The result is simple perfection, hands down the best bread you'll ever eat. The simplicity of this no need bread is what I love the most and the fact that your entire house will smell of fresh bread as you bake this. This bread could not get any easier, it's even easier than the artisan bread. All I did was selected the paragraphs in my document and one by one, handed them off to the speech synthesis utterance, 
if there was any justice in the world, you would then utter that utterance, but you don't, you speak it. But regardless, this is how easy it is to add spoken word to your web pages. And if you go to caniuse.com, caniuse.com, all one word, you'll see that the speech synthesis API is available across all major browsers and actually has been for quite a long time. So you should have no concerns about using something like this in production. It opens up a whole new world of possibilities, doesn't it? But what about our other ways of communicating? Well, TensorFlow is a machine learning library that runs locally in your browser, no cloud access necessary at all. So when you combine TensorFlow with PoseNet, your browser can begin seeing your face, your hands, and your arms. One second, let me bring that in. I had most of my links ready, but not this one. So if you'll give me just a moment. If I talk long enough, you'll never notice that I was unprepared. All right, I'm almost prepared again. Here we go. And it's as if it never happened, right? All right, so here is the same article live about this. And we can see this is what TensorFlow running in your browser combined with PoseNet brings to the party. This is machine learning at its finest, but it is detecting your joints and your torso and your arms and your legs. And you can see if we got up close on our face, it would detect our face as well. Now, if we can allow TensorFlow and PoseNet to do that, Perhaps we could allow Alexa to respond to sign language. It's a good thing I was already proposed, uh, prepared with this link as well, so you'll never notice me up popping up a new tab and coming in here. It's seamless, right? We'll edit this all out of post, I'm sure. Um, so here is a short video. We won't watch the entire thing, but I just think this is fascinating because in this example, Abhishek uses ASL or American Sign Language to speak to his computer. Those words spoken in ASL in turn are converted to speech. And that speech in turn is used to talk to Alexa on his Amazon Echo Smart speaker. Now Alexa's response is then run through a speech to text converter and the resulting text is displayed on the screen. All of this is using free and open source software and inexpensive consumer grade commodity hardware. There's no sound now, but there will be in just a moment. Alexa, hello. Hi there. Alexa, what is the weather? Right now in New York, it's 29 degrees Celsius with partly sunny skies. Today's forecast has lots of clouds with a high of 34 degrees and a low of 24 degrees. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? What we're truly doing here is unlocking the capabilities that already exist in these devices. And that is the secret. That's the key right here. These accessibility features are already here and available to us. All we have to do is be aware of them and take advantage of them. 
let me show you one more video that really makes this point very uh, uh, relatable. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. Isn't that just lovely? Isn't that nice? And again, the most important thing that we get out of this again is this isn't the disabled version of Xbox. You don't have to spend extra money on it. Of course, the controllers are what you have to spend money on, but that is universal design. You don't have to buy the disabled version of Halo or whatever game you're playing on the Xbox right now. It just works. So we're getting close to the end here. I'm looking forward to our questions at the end of this as well. Um, I, as a web architect, always like making decisions based on facts and actual numbers. I call that evidence-based architecture. You'll hear me talk about that quite a bit in a number of my talks. So here's one great example of evidence-based architecture. Uh, here's browser market share. Uh, Google Chrome makes about two thirds of the browser market right now. And after Safari, we can see all the other browsers have single digit market share. So when I'm in a meeting and the client inevitably says, but what about Internet Explorer? You've never heard that, have you? I like pulling up reports like this and saying, listen, IE doesn't even have 1% of the market these days. It's not even in the top 10 browsers. Heck, Microsoft stopped developing IE in 2015 when it announced Edge. And so I don't want to make fun of you or belittle you for wanting to include all browsers. I think that's very noble and I want to encourage that. I'm glad that you're thinking about including all browsers, not just some of the browsers. So when you take into consideration that 15% of the world, roughly 1.1 billion people have some form of disability, it kind of puts that IE question into perspective, doesn't it? Which percentages are you really focusing on right now? And let me make this perfectly clear. If you have a disability, any form of disability that makes you a member of the largest minority in the world, let's focus on the right percentages, shall we, as web developers? Because this disabled community is shockingly large. Like, it's the third largest economic power in the world with 8 
trillion dollars in disposable income, the disabled community is larger than any other economy in the world behind only the US and China in terms of spending power. And how well do you think we're supporting such a large and powerful market demographic as web developers? Well, you remember how much I like to use numbers to guide my decisions, right? Evidence-based architecture. The WebAIM organization is a US-based not-for-profit that's been doing digital accessibility work since 1999. WebAIM is short for Web Accessibility in Mind. Accessibility in Mind. They have a great free web accessibility audit tool called WAVE, W-A-V-E. And they took their accessibility tool and used it to evaluate the top 1 million websites. At this point in the presentation, do you want to make a guess as to how many accessibility errors they covered? I'll wait. The WebAIM organization discovered 60 million accessibility errors across the top 1 million websites. And this is just evaluating the homepage of these sites. They haven't even clicked in. This is simply the cover of the book. On average, that is 60 accessibility errors per homepage or one HTML element out of every 13. How do you feel about that? Do you think that maybe, I don't know, these are esoteric bugs, edge cases, and kind of weird exceptions? Sadly, they, they are not. 98% of all home pages tested had errors. And they were really boring, common, not rare at all accessibility errors. Over 80% of the pages had poor color contrast, something that is easily detectable and easily fixable since nearly every tool, including Wave, will give you the proper color contrast when it, discuss when it detects an error. This is not complicated. This is not complicated. Over two thirds of home pages featured images without alt text. I mean, really? After 30 years, who doesn't know that they need to provide alt text with an image tag? Over half of the home pages tested had empty links or malformed HTML forms with input elements that didn't have a semantically associated label element. These are so, so easy to fix. These are trivial to fix. These are essentially syntax errors. You should have a jagged red line in your IDE telling you when you're not doing these kinds of things. And if you were hoping that your web framework of choice would help you out in that regard, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. <laughs> web pages that use React have on average 10% more accessibility errors. Angular websites on average have 20% more accessibility errors. Vue.js websites have almost 25% more accessibility errors. And the WebAIM folks go out of their way to say this does not necessarily mean that the frameworks caused these accessibility errors. But what these numbers do show us is that there is an empirical, measurable, quantifiable correlation between the use of frameworks and a marked increase in accessibility errors.
I'm sure that none of you here tonight are uh, div-driven developers, right? Div, uh, div and developers or developers who use the div and span elements as their elements of choice. I'm sure no one here is, is a div-driven developer, but I don't know, maybe you work with one or two of them on your team? I don't know, maybe so. That's an interesting, if flawed, approach to web development. Because divs and spans literally mean nothing. They do not inherently represent anything. They are semantically void and should only be used when no other semantic element is appropriate. Divs and spans are the empty calories of web development. They're nutritionally void. They're the potato chips or crisps of web development. And as the WebAIM report shows, we are dying of malnutrition. We are dying of malnutrition right now. Because the web aim analysis, when it came across a div or a span, they ignored it because they had to. Divs and spans have no built-in accessibility functionality because they have no semantics. They mean nothing. So as bad as that report is, 98% of all websites have accessibility errors. 98% of all home pages have 60 accessibility errors per page or one out of every dozen elements. Do you think that as bad as that report is, do you suppose that including divs and spans would make the final results better or worse? Remember, semantics are the whole point of HTML. It's right there in the very first paragraph of the HTML5 language spec. And without semantics, we have no accessibility. And without accessibility, we are quite simply missing the whole point of the web. So where does this leave us? As you've seen today, most of our websites are painfully one dimensional, only focusing on the visual aspect, a good, well-rounded website should delight all of the senses, not just one of them. We should be focusing our efforts on universal design, designs that are usable not just by some of the people or even most of the people. We should be designing for all of the people. Because if we want our websites to be easy to find, easy to use, and easy to understand, that's what accessibility is. That's what accessibility is. And as we've seen over and over again, accessibility improves everyone's experience, not just those with a disability. If I could, I'd like to leave you with one last video, and then we can move on to the Q&A section. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. Edit a film like this one. 
When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. Isn't that fun? This is a promo video for the disabled version of the iPhone and the disabled version of the iPad and the disabled, wait. No, it wasn't, right? This was an advertisement for the iPhone and the iPad and the Mac and all of those because this is just what Apple does. And not just Apple, this is just what Google does. This is just what Microsoft does. These features are there. They're just waiting for us to discover them and incorporate them into our development process. Did you enjoy yourself this evening? I certainly did. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. I know that we have a number of questions that we want to uh, uh, get in here as well, but um, Stephanie, let me briefly turn this over to you and, uh, um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we go. For now, we only have one question and I think Scott, this is not <laughs> addressed for you, but to uh, the both Fernandos who are in the call right now and who are doing the uh, sign language for us. I'm super happy and thanks again for- um, Yes, thank you so <laughs> much for signing. I was watching that for uh, half my presentation and I, I just loved it. So uh, thank you once again for that. Um, so the question was, uh, is it International Sign Language, ASL, DGS, LSE? Maybe one of <laughs> So what, what's interesting is American Sign Language is just that, American Sign Language. I know that there's also a BSL, a British Sign Language. I don't know. Uh, it, it's, uh, someone needs to tell me, what is the German uh, version of sign language? Is it GSL? If there's any justice in the world, it's GSL. <laughs> Can you post an answer to the chat window? I'm looking at it right now. Ah, Deutschen Gebarden Sprache. Oh, see, I'm not even going to try to speak it. I apologize. Oh. I'd be better signing it than speaking it at that point, right? Um, Fernando, thank you so much uh, for uh, Fernando's, I guess, plural. Uh, uh, oh, LSE, yes, Lengua de Sinos Española. Um, I hablo de español, uh, solamente palabras, but uh, I'm, I'm much better at español than I am Deutsch. Um, All right. Uh, so, uh, Scott, if you could switch to the presentation that uh, Jenna and I shared with you, then we can see the questions in the slides. Very good. I will, I will do that. One question that I did see come up before I stop sharing this screen, um, although I might, at, at any rate, one question came up, what tools can I use to test for accessibility in my organization? Hopefully the first tool you're going to reach for is your iPhone or your Android in your pocket. I really hope that you don't focus on audit reports, that you focus on experiencing this. When you're building a web page, you click through it. There's no way that you would build a web page and never experience it and push it to production and hope that some automated usability report would uh, capture any usability bugs for you. So there is no reason why you shouldn't feel empowered at this point. You shouldn't feel excited to reach out and grab your iPhone and your Android and experience that web page yourself. And you're not going to be good at it. And that's okay. I'm not good at it. I'm not the primary user of these accessibility features, but I know how to get around. I know enough how to triple click and twist. And when you do that, it really does open up your eyes to all the possibilities. When you visit a web page, you don't read it word for word, you scan it. When I'm evaluating a new library and NPM that I'm trying to include, I'll scan all the headers. I'll say, all right, name of the project, creators, history, installation. Okay, that's what I want. I'm visually scanning those headers till I find the section that I want, and then I read on. When you triple click and twist, you're doing the same thing. When you twist and end up on headers, you can orally listen to the headers. And then you can swipe right or swipe down to continue from there. So using 
the accessibility tools should absolutely be your first choice. Your second choice is built into every Google Chrome browser. Every Google Chrome browser, if you pull up the developer tools, you should have a Lighthouse tab. You have elements and console and sources, and typically all the way to the very end, you should have a Lighthouse tab. In earlier versions, this was called Audit. So if you don't have a Lighthouse tab, you might have Audit, but Chrome auto updates itself. So you must have been doing something not to have a Lighthouse uh, tab in your browser at this point. But notice all the things that it will test for you. Performance, progressive web apps or PWA, SEO, search engine optimization. Oh my goodness, accessibility is the best way for you to boost your search engine optimization. Think about this for a moment. Google can't view your images, but it can read your alt text. Google can't watch your videos, but it can index your transcripts. Google can't listen to your podcast, but it can index the transcripts that you're released associated with these things. And I use these things all the time. When I'm on the bus, if I've forgotten my headphones, I listen to my podcast with transcripts turned on so I don't get attacked for being rude to my other fellow bus or, bus or train passengers. So this is a great example of how these features get used all the time. I have an 18 year old son who loves watching Japanese anime and he has gotten so used to watching Japanese anime with the closed captioning turned on, with the subtitles turned on, that he just watches all videos that way. And this isn't unique to him. This is a very generational thing. College students, over half of all college students turn on closed captioning when they're watching videos related to their coursework. Because in academic study after academic study, it's been shown that that improves knowledge retention. It improves your knowledge retention because you're getting that information across multiple channels, through the visual channel, through the aural channel, and others. But here's accessibility as well. Notice that it's gonna to default to a mobile device because your users are going to be using mobile devices as well. But here, I'm, as I'm talking, I'm gonna go ahead and generate a Lighthouse report for thirstyhead.com, my website. That, by the way, is where you can find these slides as well, as well as slides to my other presentations. So Lighthouse is warming up. There we go. So one of the things I like about Lighthouse is uh, uh, almost, oh, they used to have cute little factoids that they would include as well. Um, but at this point, you now have a, a lovely little audit report telling you on a scale from one to 100, how I'm doing in terms of performance, how I'm doing in terms of SEO and accessibility. So, it's telling me, oh uh, yeah, that I need to properly size my images. I agree. Enormous payloads. I made you download almost 12 megabytes of images. I definitely need to optimize my images. This is a known problem, bad Scott, bad Scott for this. But I do get 100% on accessibility. It shows me the audits that it passed. Uh, it shows me the things that are non-applicable. And this was a long way coming, but this is why I tell you to use your smartphone first and rely on audit reports second. Audit reports can at best capture maybe 25%, maybe 35% of all accessibility errors in your website. This is not 100%. This is why you need to experience it yourself. Because an audit report can tell you if an image has alt text, but it can't tell you if it's good alt text, if it's descriptive alt text, or if it's image 000001.jpg. Another tool that I use quite a bit, oh, and by the way, before we leave Lighthouse, know that you can NPM install Lighthouse and you can run this a part of your CD pipeline as well. 
So I like using it in browser for ad hoc reporting, but if you NPM install this, you can have this report be a regular part of your build process. If you've read the book, Building Evolutionary Architecture, Building Evolutionary Architecture is by Rebecca Parsons, the CTO of ThoughtWorks. Uh, it's by Neil Ford, a colleague of mine who's also a fellow a developer advocate, and Patrick Hua. They wrote this book uh, last year and they talk about fitness functions. And so what we see here, performance, accessibility, SEO, these are all great examples of fitness functions. We all know what unit tests are. These test the health of your individual functions or your individual classes or your individual APIs. Fitness functions are on the far end of the spectrum and they test the health of your architecture. So if you're interested more on learning more about fitness functions, look for Rebecca Parsons, look for Neil Ford, lots of presentations online. And I think of fitness functions using the apps mnemonic, APPS. If you look at your application through the prism of accessibility, performance, privacy, and security, APPS apps, those are four really good fitness functions that you can begin with. But one more tool before I pull up the rest of these is a great tool called Totally, T-O-T-A-1-1-Y, Totally. And what's nice about this is that this is open source. You can install it as a browser extension, but I like running it as a JavaScriptlet right in my page. When you're running totally, you get a little set of cool sunglasses in the lower left-hand corner. And if you click those cool little sunglasses, it's not exhaustive, but it tells you, hey, are your headings in the right order? Is your color contrast within spec? Do you have links with text? Do you have labels identifying your form? Do you have image alt text? So I can go in in each case and it tells me, oh, look, right here, this relevant code, I've got an H4 that directly became behind an H2. Maybe you liked the way that looked visually, but this is a semantics fail. So why don't you instead have an H3 follow an H2 and use CSS to style that to your liking rather than using an invalid, incorrect, semantic element. How's my color contrast look? Oh, all right, I've got an insufficient color contrast right here and here are the little things. And it tells me exactly what the proper color contrast would be. If I have links that say click here, it'll identify those so you can have better links. If I have input elements that don't have a label associated with them, it will highlight them. If I have images without alt text, it'll identify those as well. So I feel between pulling out your iPhone and Android and testing it yourself, experiencing it yourself, running a set of Lighthouse reports that you already have in the browser of your choice, and you can NPM install it to make it a part of your CD pipeline. And then your third tool using something like Totally. I feel like those are three really nice tools you can use to, uh, um, to evaluate these things. So how's that for a long answer to a short question? Stephanie, um, rather than uh, spending more time pulling up that slide, uh, could you just help me out? What are, what are some of the other questions real quick? And I'd be happy to answer them this way. Thank you for, uh, uh, for being patient with me. That's totally fine. If you could just switch to the Google Docs mode so we can have the captioning thing then. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Ah, I should have done that. I'm sure. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. We are learning. So. <laughs> we are all okay. learning. Okay. So next questions. Um, what are good sources to get the last and best practices for universal design? 
Ooh, that's a very good question. There are a lot of resources out there. The link that I showed you was actually universaldesign.org. Let's see, and I believe it might be one of the first hits that, that comes up. If not, universaldesign.org. Uh, is it .com? Okay, this might be a different website, a, a .com. Let me see if there's a .org. But um, as, as always, um, there's, a, there are, there's a lot of interesting uh, reading about there. Yeah, universaldesign.org. I should have just trusted my instincts. And I'll turn back on closed captioning. Um, so universaldesign.org is, is, is a great resource for uh, these kinds of things. Cool. All right, then we have the next question. Did you use TensorFlow for accessibility in any of your projects? Ah, this is a good question. Does it count if I am about to use TensorFlow.js in one of my projects? Um, one of the reasons why we're experimenting with closed captioning right now is ThoughtWorks is truly distributed at core. That's how we describe ourselves, distributed at core. ThoughtWorks is a company of 6,000 people across 18 countries and 40 business offices. And almost all of our meetings now are through Zoom, are through remote. And so we are looking for ways that we can begin including closed captioning in all these meetings. Now, there are a number of options out there. We're beginning to evaluate not only effectiveness and accuracy, but also cost. And many of these solutions will range somewhere from about $2 an hour US for a machine learning based uh, uh, solution to 20 cents an hour for a machine learning based solution. As we've learned though, if we try to bring in a live captioner, that could be somewhere between two and 300 euros for an hour meeting. So there are a lot of cost things that we're evaluating, but TensorFlow.js is quite appealing to me, not only from an accessibility aspect, but from a performance aspect and from a privacy aspect as well. Because TensorFlow.js runs in my browser without any cloud services. All these other transcription services from Amazon, from Google, from Otter AI, from Firefly.ai, and a number of other ones out there that we're evaluating, all involve us sending text up to the cloud, excuse me, audio up to the cloud, and receiving the text transcripts back. Something like this that wouldn't bother me since that's a public meeting to begin with, but if we're dealing with client work and we have sensitive information going on, if we were dealing with government work where you had to have a top secret clearance in order to do those things, those, those solutions wouldn't be there. And the reason why I'm looking at TensorFlow.js specifically for video conferencing kind of solutions within ThoughtWorks is because all of the cloud-based services have a shared model that we all are trying to fit onto that bell curve. So if I spoke German with a terrible English accent, the German version of Alexa probably wouldn't understand me. So that model, if we can move from the cloud, a shared model that everyone has to try to match to TensorFlow that runs in your browser, we can train individual models. We can have those models understand everyone's individual speech patterns. And that will give us not only a free solution that is more performant because there's no round tripping to the cloud, that is more secure because there's no round tripping to the cloud. That feels like what we would ultimately try to uh, deal with. And Google is working on a project right now called Project Euphonia. Project Euphonia. And there are a wonderful set of videos that you can watch that are exactly this, that are Google using TensorFlow.js on a local device, training models for individuals 
not individuals who share all the same type of disability, but literally individuals. And I think this is the future of this kind of speech to text translation. We're still very early days. It's still more academic than commercial, but this is where I think it's going. And if you want kind of a fun way of learning about this, The Art of AI uh, with Robert Downey Jr. Here we go. Is a YouTube series of videos where he talks about a lot of these things. Episode one or two is specifically about Project Euphonia. So if you want kind of a fun, high production value, uh, kind of television caliber uh, way of looking at this, the Art of AI with Robert Downey Jr. is a five or six episode series. It's a YouTube original. But you can also look at the Project Euphonia videos released by Google. They're also very high quality. But TensorFlow.js is about to be a part of my toolkit. That's something I'm quite literally going to be working on next week. Excellent question. Thank you for asking. All right. So do we have two questions left. Here yes. we go. About the number of 15 of uh, about the number of the 15% of people that have a disability, how yes. can they further be sub subdivided so that I as a developer can try to account for different types of disabilities specifically? This is a really thoughtful question. Thank you so much. Um because when I talk about 1 billion people worldwide having a disability, um, only some of those people have low vision or blindness. Only some of those people have hearing loss or full deafness. Um, many uh, uh, people uh, have, and let me pull up uh, this lovely little uh, um, kind of a visual cue right here. Um, Many people have a, a, a physical disability. As we saw in that Xbox video, it could be someone who literally doesn't have an arm or fingers, but it could also be people who have a tremor, who can't use a mouse with high accuracy or can't touch on a glass screen with high accuracy. So there are visual disabilities, there are oral disabilities, there are um, physical uh, manual disabilities, but the one that isn't shown here are cognitive disabilities. If you have autism, if you have Down syndrome, if you have dyslexia, if you have colorblindness, colorblindness makes up almost 10% of uh, that, that disability population right there. So while I appreciate what you're asking, I wanna make sure that I cover all these various things. You're right, we can't just have a single coarse grain stamp, yes, we're done here. In fact, the best way for you to make sure that you've got an idea of what's going on is to go to the W3C way initiative, WAI. The W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium. That's where Tim Berners-Lee uh, uh, founded HTML and the Web Accessibility Initiative. And they've got a ton of great videos in here, including, and this is where I wanted to take us, a free training course called Introduction to Web Accessibility. I've taken this course, it's quite good. Lots of videos. The slides can be dry. I apologize, but the videos really do redeem it. Um, but this is the best way, and they will take you through addressing the spectrum of disabilities that you want to be aware of. But the easiest way to think of them are in terms of vision, hearing, manual dexterity, and the hidden one, cognitive disabilities. Very good question, thank you for asking. All right, last but not least, Christian is writing. Hello, we are developing an, inter, an 
an internal application based on HTML. So we have to use standalone tools or browser plugins. Different tools have different accessibility checks. We use, uh, we use some slash all tools and combine the hints. Do you have any advice for simplifying this process? Ah, this is a good question. Um, so much of the effort when we're talking about accessibility goes into audit reporting. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do audit reports. You should, that should be one of your fitness functions. You should be running lighthouse reports. Oh, uh, we talked about the web aim wave tool. Um, this one is, is quite good. The web accessibility evaluation tool um, that has these things. But you're right, there are a number of different tools out there. At best, they are going to capture a quarter to a third of all of your accessibility issues. At best, they're gonna capture somewhere between 25% and 35% of the errors that you want. But if you want to be very specific, all of these tools are testing WCAG compliance and what a mouthful, what an unpronounceable acronym this is, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline. But most of those tools are giving you a score based on WCAG 2.1, which is the latest version of these specifications. And you'll see that there are different levels of accessibility, single A, double A, and triple A. Triple A is unobtainium. If you can achieve that, my hat is off to you. And I'm wondering if you're hiring. I'd like to work for you. You're that good. Um, WCAG 2.1 double A compliance is what most of these tools are trying to evaluate towards. So I would find the tool that gives you the best uh, experience in achieving WCAG 2.1 AA compliance. Um, and the unfortunate answer is it might not be just one tool as you've already discovered. So good for you for your commitment to this. Perhaps you could focus on the underlying standard and work directly on that. And that might help you uh, simplify your tool chain a bit. All right. That was all of the questions. We can wait one, two, three, if something <laughs> is popping up. But it doesn't look like that. So I would say a big, big thank you to you, Scott. Thanks for waking up in the morning and yes. <laughs> coming on our virtual stage. And of course, thanks everyone for joining. You will all get um, the recording and we will also share the link uh, to Scott's website one more time with you over our meetup pages. So uh, make sure you RSVP with yes so we, you will receive our messages. And I wish you a lovely evening or a good morning wherever you are. And thanks, Scott, last words from your side. <laughs> no, thank you so much for having me. It's really a treat. And thank you for your attention and your enthusiasm. I love the questions. Uh, filing in. I hope you're excited about this because I, I truly am. When I focus on conversational UIs with Alexa and Siri, that's simply an accessibility feature that's broken through and gotten to the mainstream. So accessibility to me isn't a niche topic at all. This, in fact, is the future of the web. So I feel like any time and energy we spend focusing on this is time and energy well spent because what you're doing is you're advancing the state of the art. So thank you once again. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.